I want to tell a story that will help us to understand some of the properties of our economic system that might not be apparent based on the set of anecdotes and stories that we normally gravitate to to understand our economy. And in particular, I'm interested in laying out how players on one level of a system can have their game theory and their game they're playing that can actually act on a different layer of the system to change the moral frame of that other layer in their own interest. And this is done, of course, in this story at least, through money, although money is not the only source of power for making something like this happen. But that's kind of a weird thing, that a community could have their entire moral frame bended a little bit or shifted a little bit without realizing that both money and the game theory on some other layer of the system could be responsible for that shift. That's pretty weird. But there's going to be five patterns that I see in our economic system that I'm trying to draw out through this story. That if you look at our current economy with some of these patterns in mind, you will see things that you would not if you didn't have a story like this sitting in the back of your mind. So first off, what are those five things so that you can be looking out for them? One of these has to do with the fact that different vantage points in the system will give people completely different understandings of the game theory. So something that can be a correct understanding and model of the system from one vantage point, if you move to a different vantage point, that way of looking at things actually no longer holds at all. You need an entirely different understanding of the game theory to understand it from a closer perspective or from a farther perspective or just from a different actor's perspective. So understanding that two different theories can both be right, even if they are perhaps even seemingly contradictory. That's a weird thing, but Part of my deal in teaching economics is I want to convey there is so much paradox built into human motivation that if you're not comfortable with paradox and you're not comfortable with different vantage points having different correct perspectives, you will not understand our economic system. The second thing to watch out for in the system is the game theory of mythologies and moral frames. How the way our moral frames and mythologies evolve has a a game theory dynamic, and sometimes that game theory is connected to other layers of the system, like the financial layer or like community layers. There's just different uh, structures in the system that may actually move in and change the the fundamental understanding of our our morals in ways that we cannot understand from certain vantage points. The third thing here is the notion of veto power or the power of being able to do a favor, the power of being able to act in a game theory way on some dimension that is not exactly money, but uses money behind it. The fourth pattern here is the strategic use of in-groups to shift the moral frame of their own group on behalf of an outgroup. And then the last factor here relates to human communities who have shared values, shared relationships, who care about each other, who have all of these beautiful things. And the way that the game theory on these different layers of the dragon is going to interact with those communities and change those communities in ways that they may not be aware of. So just watch out for those as we're going through the story and I'll return to them again at the end. Now our story will take place in a mid-sized town with a university. And there's really going to be two big players, two big actors in the town. One is the university itself and the other is going to be an oligopoly. And in particular, this is going to be a publishing industry oligopoly that makes up 80% of the children's literature market. That's the setting I'm going to make for our little oligopoly. Now, keep in mind, when you're mapping this story onto what's going on in the real world, what I'm calling the oligopoly, these dynamics can be true if we're talking about a country or a government agency or a not-for-profit. There are so many different setups where... Um, an actor can have the same role as our oligopoly in this story. And what is the nature of the relationship between our university and our oligopoly? Well, it turns out it's a really good mutually supportive relationship because the university can have courses related to children's literature, related to that industry. They network with the industry and the students love those networks, those internship opportunities. So the university gets a lot of prestige by having this close relationship 
with the children's publishing industry. And of course, the children's publishing industry, they get their talent from the university, they get prestige from the university. There's a lot of mutual support here. Now, there's also going to be a little bit of financial entanglement, in particular because our oligopoly is going to fund a bunch of students to go to this local university. As a matter of fact, our oligopoly is going to pay full price for those students, and that's going to make up a decently sizable share of the student body at this university. And this financial entanglement will end up playing an unfortunate role in our story. Now, we also want to understand the social nature of our two communities where each of these is going to have a moral frame, a mythology, and a set of shared values that brings them together as a community. There's also going to be both competition and cooperation within that community, where the competition and cooperation are, sh are framed around that moral frame, that mythology, and that is super meaningful to the people who know each other, who have real community relationships. And this is going to be true in both our oligopoly and our university. So the university, we might ask, what is the game of the university? What's the moral frame? What's the, um, what, what is the, what are the values? And seeking truth, of course, is one of the values. People go into academia because they love research. They love coming to understand things afresh for the first time. They love teaching and interacting with people over ideas. And that, the moral frame has some of that built in. Now, of course, there's going to be other shared moral frames. There could be political frames that are similar among people in a university. There could be religious frames that are similar. So we, we allow the the possibility that it's not just about truth-seeking, that there are some other layers to that moral frame of that community. But pointing out the fact that there's both competition and cooperation, a lot of the little mini-games around awards people get and recognition and who gets newspaper articles from the university press written about them, that stuff is all aimed around the community's moral frame, where there is competition between people for those spots of prestige, so that is a competitive element, but it's also cooperative in the sense that it's serving this, uh, this frame of values. Now, the same thing will be true in our oligopoly, where the people there do not just care about money. As a matter of fact, the history of this particular oligopoly is actually associated with a particular church. And I'm going to let this be the star religion. It's some religion that has a particular church, and the founders of each of our three oligopolist publishing firms all go to the same church. They all serve the same values. They, they have have really deep and meaningful experiences with their religion, and they truly believe the world would be a better place if more people would adopt the star religion. And the social setting for this particular oligopoly is not at all oriented around money. It's almost entirely oriented around spreading goodness in the world by spreading their religion and their perception of good values through the children's literature that they put out. And of course, what that means is if you want to move up in this publishing industry, it's not a bad idea to go to that particular church, to profess that particular religion, to get on board as much as you can with the social values of the higher ups in these organizations. And that kind of permeates the entire community of publishers. All of that is just the setup for the story. It's the setting in which this story takes place. But the story actually starts when we have a publishing company company from across the country. We're going to call it the Purple Publishing Company. And it starts to put out literature, including some literature critical of the star religion, and it starts to gain popularity. Like our publishing industry, our little three firm oligopoly, they make up 80% of the market for children's literature. But Purple Publishing has reached 10%, is about to move to 15%, and is starting to crowd out some of the market for our three oligopolist firms. Now, this is a problem on two different levels. It's a problem on the level of the, the community of people who love each other and care about each other. And it's a problem on the level of our religion that they're trying to spread. So we are setting up these people as not caring about money. Money is only going to have an instrumental role in achieving the things they actually care about. The two dimensions that drive everybody 
at the top of this oligopoly are caring about the people that they have real relationships with, whose welfare they're in charge of, the people underneath them in the firm, and caring about the spread of their religion. Those are the two motivators for these people. And they find, actually, if that purple publishing company gets too much bigger, they're going to have to cut staff. They're going to have to lay off people that they deeply, deeply care about, people underneath their care. And they want to make sure that doesn't happen. They also recognize how evil it is that the purple publishing company is saying things against their religion. It's basically, in their view, spreading evil throughout the world. So the, the leaders of these three firms, they recognize the need for themselves to behave as heroes, to stop the layoffs in their organization, to stop the spread of evil anti-religious uh, sentiment in the population. And the thing is, these are really smart business people. They're good at networking, they're good at making connections, they understand the legal framework, they have uh, connections in parliament or connections in congress that they can uh, pull some strings if they need to. And they're willing to do that to be a hero for their community and their religion. But they also have a problem, which is that um, the general populace might not understand their perspective, the general populace doesn't understand how things work, doesn't understand the importance of their religion, they're kind of just ignorant, if you know what I mean. So if word got out about them pulling these strings in this industry, that could sink their whole ship. Like, their entire community could go bust, not just the few people they'd have to lay off because of purple publishing. So it's really important for them to avoid... Um, what they're doing in terms of pulling strings being discovered. And the thing is, they actually have some uh, ways of warding off being found out on this front. The problem is, to make that happen, they would need to do some things that are against free speech um, to stop people from talking about what they're doing. So they would basically need to pass some anti-free speech legislation to get away with some of the things they need to do to protect their community. And that's where this story starts to turn around this anti-free speech legislation. Can this community of people in our mid-sized town pass anti-free speech legislation that would allow them to do the things they need to do to support their people and their values. Now, this is where the university comes into the story, because the executives of our oligopoly recognize that if they can get the university on board with the anti-free speech legislation, that would probably be enough to render the support to pass it. In other words, the people in the university, those people have high up connections, they have enough sway with enough people and enough sway with people in power to actually make things happen if the community really supports it. But our problem here is our university community is not really an anti-free speech type of community. So many of these people are academics who want to speak their mind and are skeptical of anti-free speech legislation. So the question is, what can our executives do to actually get this legislation through? And here is what they do. Basically, they know some people in the university who kind of understand how things work in society, who understand that some things need to be kept private, and who are willing to meet with the executives. So we might imagine that this is three people who are high up in the university, who have a lot of wisdom about the way the world works, and they hold a meeting with the leaders of our three oligopolist publishing firm industry people. And in that meeting, the oligopolists say this. They say, hey, we're threatened. If we're threatened, you're threatened because you depend on us. We need your help with something, and most people won't understand this, but we know that the three of you actually will understand it. So here's the thing. If you don't support us on this anti-free speech legislation, we're going to have to withdraw the funding we're giving to support all of these students at full price to go to your university. We just don't have another choice other than to do that, because otherwise we're going to shrink, otherwise this purple publishing could actually put, a, put us out of business or um, hurt us in some way. We do have a mutually good relationship, we've had a great relationship so far. What we need you as the university to do is to support the anti-free speech legislation. That is their threat slash 
collaborative conversation. Now our three university leaders in this case, they recognize the reality of that threat, they understand the position that these oligopolists are in, and they agree with our oligopolists. They say, okay, we see it, we understand, we will do our best to get this community in support of the anti-free speech legislation. But now the problem's literally just passed from the oligopolists to the leaders of the university. And they face the same problem, how do you get a community that is not naturally in support of anti-free speech legislation, how do you get them to be on board with this legislation? And yet at the same time, the transfer of this problem from the oligopoly to the university leaders, that transfer is an incredibly strategic move because the university leaders actually have the knowledge and skills and experience to shift and morph that community's moral frame. Whereas an outsider doesn't understand the frame enough, doesn't speak the language, doesn't know how it operates on top of that community, and therefore the oligopolists could not shift the moral frame of the university. Whereas the university leaders, they actually have expertise in this. Now at this point, we notice how much this conversation is going to resonate with these three university leaders. Because they are aware if they lost the revenue from those full price students, they would probably have to cut departments. They would have to cut staff that they care about. And their game, the game that's so meaningful to them, would be shrunk. So they know that they need to do everything they can to make sure this doesn't happen. And once again, we can ask the question, are these three driven by money? And the way I've set this up, no, they're not. And yet, they're doing something that's primarily nudged by fear of something that's related to the money, fear of the loss of this revenue. So this is just me pointing out the way some of these economic forces operate. All right, so how do these university leaders actually go about this shift? And it turns out they are the perfect people to do this because they have so many years of experience going to meetings at the university where the whole purpose of the meeting is to come to some kind of consensus as a group around the moral frame and the mythology of that community and their values. And if you walk into any of these meetings among faculty and among university administration, they're basically battling it out over whose ideas, whose hopes for implementing some sort of program fit best with the moral frame of the community. That is the game of university meetings, and people who have moved up in the system are really good at this. And I think it's useful here to refer to Jonathan Haidt's elephant and rider analogy about how the human soul and deliberative part of their brain works. Where the elephant is the gut, it's the part that wants things, that's attracted to things and repulsed by things, and it's very instinctual. Now, of course, this doesn't mean it's bad. Sometimes the elephant is selfish, sometimes the elephant is very in tune with the values that uh, the, the person has trained their, their instincts with. Within. So it's neither good nor bad, but it is sort of gut and reactive. Whereas the writer is the more deliberative part of the brain. It's the more sort of conscious and aware and uh, logical part of the brain in some ways. But he points out that the writer's main job is to justify the desires of the elephant. And to do that, to justify those desires as the PR person for the elephant, by using the relevant moral frame that that particular community operates on. So that's how faculty meetings generally go. Generally, people are arguing according to what is best, according to our values as a community. But you can kind of see underneath some of the arguments that some people just have something they want, and they're trying to use that moral frame to get what they want. And other people are a little bit more neutral and their ideas are more in line with supporting the values. I mean, this is just the whole task of faculty meetings is navigating this landscape where everybody at the table has a PR person for their elephant, and they're using that moral frame to argue in favor of their elephant's hopes. Now, what does it look like for these three university leaders to actually go about the business of shifting the moral frame of that community? 
And I always bring up salience frames. I think this is relevant here, where salience is basically how heavily does something weigh into your intuition, your um, what, what you notice, what is relevant and salient to you. That would be a high salience thing. And a low salience thing would be something maybe you're a little bit aware of, but you hardly ever think about. It's kind of on the edge of your frame of reference. It's not relevant. And the task here is going to be to take the moral uh, intuitions, the moral values of this community, and for any value that happens to support the anti-free speech legislation, you want to lift that up in salience and lift it up in positive val valence so that people know, oh, if you tout those arguments in support of the anti-free speech legislation, people will admire you, they'll view you as being someone who's an advocate for our values and our communities. Um, um, our community's moral frame, whereas they want to take the stuff that's pro-free speech and they want to make it less salient, they want to move it aside to the side of the frame where people aren't thinking about it, or they also want to attach a negative valence, a negative emotion to it, such that people who tout those pro-free speech arguments, those are kind of disgusting people, they're kind of associated with the villainous outgroup, and we don't want to give too much weight to them if we want to be moral people. And through that reweighting of the salience frame, they can bend that moral frame of the community in support of what the oligopolists really need to have. Happen. And of course, these university leaders with all of their experience have a strong intuition for how to go about this, which is mainly to target people's elephant, to target people's gut reaction, but then to also have some really strong arguments for the PR person writer that people can latch onto once their elephant is on board with veering more toward the anti-free speech legislation. And targeting the elephant is done in a number of ways. I mean, I think disgust, like disgust at those outgroup oriented people who are making those anti-free speech arguments, that disgust is picked up by everybody in the room, and most people will kind of uh, adjust what they're saying based on any disgust toward those people bringing up the pro-free speech arguments. But also, just like accolades and, and high levels of respect and admiration for people who come up with new and creative arguments in favor of the anti-free speech legislation, in some ways, part of the task here is um, the way you channel the, the type of attention you pay to people who make the pro-free speech versus uh, pro-anti-free speech legislation arguments, that type of attention is going to actually change the salience frame of everybody in any given meeting that's happening. It's also helpful that these three leaders have some control over the agenda at these meetings and the way things are discussed as leaders of those meetings. So that will help sort of bend what's on people's minds, what people know at the water cooler is going to be talked about at the next faculty meeting, so they need to put some thought into it. They, that control over the agenda is part of political power in general, and these three leaders have some of that. So the result of this is it doesn't happen instantaneously, but over a few weeks, maybe a few months, there is this bending of the community's orientation around this particular issue, this particular legislation, in favor of what the oligopolists need. Now, is that enough to actually pass the legislation? And it actually might be. So that's going to be almost the end of our story, where the, the anti-free speech legislation passes, the members of the university community are now uh, much more in support of anti-free speech legislation than they would have been six months ago, and they may not even be aware that there was this bending of their moral frame. They just know that topics in the news and topics that become relevant force them to think more about a topic, and when they think more about it, as they have done, they sometimes uh, develop new perspectives and uh, new ways of thinking about it. That's just the natural way that people's thought process evolves. So they're not aware that their own moral frame has been influenced in a way that happened through money, that happened as part of somebody else's game theory who was not part of their university community. Now, the last part Part of the story has to do with purple publishing. So purple publishing has been hiring an investigative journalist to look into some of these tactics that are
are being used by the oligopoly. And this investigative journalist has basically uncovered the story, the true story about what went down. And from the perspective of Purple Publishing, Everything that has happened was driven by greed and was driven by money. They recognize this oligopoly is just afraid of losing their market power, losing their money, and therefore they've done all of these things behind the scenes, including getting this anti-free speech legislation passed out of greed. So the question is, is Purple Publishing correct about their perspective on money and greed driving this sort of force? And I'm going to say that yes, they are absolutely correct, even though I have specifically set up this situation such that the oligopolists are not at all driven by money. They're driven by care for the people in the firms they run, they're driven by desire to spread good through the world through the spread of their religion, those are the only things driving them, not money. And yet every action they took aligns with them expanding their market power, expanding their money. And so of course this is just me pointing out that when we're thinking about how economics works, we think in terms of money and people's drive to expand money, we also need to think about what are the motives behind that money. If money is a secondary motivator, what is the primary motivator? And having both of those perspectives in our lens is going to give us a more full picture of what's going on. So what happened with our investigative journalist's amazing work? And of course, it got suppressed. As a matter of fact, this was the whole point of the anti-free speech legislation. This was that our oligopolists foresaw ahead of time that someone like the investigative journalist could come along, and she basically represents evil incarnate for them. All of the good in the world that they have been working their entire lives to create through the spread of their religion and the care of the people underneath them in the firm, all of that is... Uh, destroyed and intentionally destroyed by the efforts of someone like this investigative journalist. So you notice this battle between the oligopolists and the investigative journalist, that was won by the oligopolists before it even began. Before she was even hired by Purple Publishing to look into what was going on, the anti-free speech legislation passed. So that's the end of our story. And it's not a happy story for us. But it's a super happy story for our oligopolist heroes who are smart and strategic and doing everything they can for their goals. So let me just drive home a few of the points I'm trying to make with this story. Where one of them is that we see the evolution of a whole community's moral frame in response to the game theory of somebody else's game. The oligopolist's game is coming in and influencing the moral frame of the universe. And that's actually a kind of weird thing. But I do think we live in an age where the economic mythology is changing quickly because of artificial intelligence and other new technologies and changing power dynamics in the global sphere. There is a lot of stuff that's changing right now. And the, the shifting of the moral frame around how economics works, how systems work, that's part of the game. And this is me pointing out how some of those shifts may not actually be driven by natural thinking within that particular community. Some of these shifts may actually be driven by money and the way money operates for people on a different layer of the system to accomplish their goals by shifting the moral frame in particular communities elsewhere in the system. And in this case, of course, that moral shift was around principles of free speech. But there are so many different aspects of our moral frame that could shift in favor of the dragon, the system that's so destructive, or that could shift against the dragon. And so many of the forces will pull those shifts in the direction of something that will support the dragon. The second thing I want to point out is that the perspective on the game theory is different depending on where you're sitting inside the system. So if you take some random professor in this community that's in support of the anti-free speech legislation, their perspective on the game theory is that their community has these genuine values and they've seen the genuine values evolve naturally through conversation and that their support of that change is actually normal and driven by them as a community. That's their perspective on the game theory. The game theory for them is really them versus those evil free speech people who are a part of their outgroup. 
if you shift that perspective to one of the three administrators who are the people involved in that meeting, for them, the game theory is about protecting the values of the community, protecting that community's game from having to shrink itself because they would have to cut departments. That's their game that they're playing that's salient to them in this frame. And they are somewhat aware of the fact that the shift around free speech was really about the congealing around the protection of their community's values. If you shift to the oligopolists' perspective, the game theory was really about them protecting their community of people whose jobs they support and their religion. That's what their game is about, and everything else is for or against that particular game. If you shift to purple publishing, this is about a financial battle between their ability to participate and to grow as a small player in the market versus the oligopolists' need to expand and, and protect their financial interests. That's the game that that they see. And the thing is, every single one of these games is an accurate depiction of the game theory. It's just that to understand the system, you need all of those perspectives at once. The next thing I want to point out is the fact that the financial layer of this system is interacting with these other layers, these other games people are playing, in ways that is not always straightforward. You notice the main way that money entered this story was not by paying for something that the oligopolists needed. Rather, it was by calling in a favor of the university by threatening to withdraw something that they have grown used to. And that's definitely a financial threat that is um, acting as a tool, a strategic tool to play out the game theory of the oligopoly. So is it a financial layer of the system? Absolutely. There's a financial layer that is underpinning this change that happened. Adjusting how we think about the way money operates to include not just paying for something, but threatening to withdraw payment that supports somebody's game that's meaningful to them, that's just another... Uh, tool in our toolbox for thinking about economic systems. This video is part of the Dragon series, and I didn't mention the Dragon at the beginning because I think the video kind of stands on its own, even for people who aren't following the Dragon series. But if you made it this far in the video and you liked it, you might like the other videos in the Dragon series, which I'll link to below and hopefully also somewhere else on the screen.